This is tonight, I'm Bruce Whitfield, and this is part two of the legacy of World War I and subsequent conflicts and the influence it has on our lives today. Joining me at the JSE studios, Peter Bauer, Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Economic and Financial Sciences at the University of Johannesburg, Alan Sinclair, Curator of the Ditsong National Museum of Military History, and Adrian Saville, Chief Investment Officer at Canon Asset Managers. Last night on the show, we universally agreed that war was a terrible thing, but I think it was Adrian Saville who made the strongest case for war to say that, provided did you play away games like the Americans tend to do ever since World War One, Two, and through their involvement in Vietnam, uh, Iraq twice, Afghanistan and other parts of the world, American infrastructure doesn't get harmed and the American military machine is a big generator of jobs and taxes for the US economy. For the rest of the world, however, it causes decades of destruction and it is deeply unpleasant for societies. However, a book by Ian Morris, the guy who became famous by talking about why the West rules for now, has has written a recent book and he says on average we are better off as societies today because our forefathers fought wars and it goes to the building of civilizations why did people start congregating in, in towns and villages that became cities Adrian Savile 10,000 years ago it's because it was safer to do so if my town and city was bigger and more powerful than yours the odds of my and my future generation survival was greatly enhanced that is as a result of violence and war it is a good thing Adrian <laughs> Savile he said desperately trying <laughs> to get some agreement around the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not mm. sure I agree with all aspects of your uh, economic Ian or Morris's historical hypothesis, <laughs> analysis. I'm just summarizing. Um, there's much, many more reasons to congregate and aggregate uh, as a society or community. Though, is absolutely pivotal to it. It's one of them. Um, you know, another is just a more fundamental human need. We are gregarious animals. We like being together. Um, you can have my neighbors any day. <laughs> <laughs> economies of scale, economies of scope, specialization, and then we can trade. And I if we're living in remote and isolated communities, uh, I'm going to be a farmer, you're going to be a farmer. What are we going to trade with? Mm. Uh, we'll swap each other's pigs. I'm not sure. Um, uh, so it's much more than just safety. Okay, but I is trade the cause of war then? I is, is trade and the, de and the desire to control and manage trade routes, is, uh, historically, is that a cause of war? Yes, because you had to protect those and you had to create them. Yes. And obviously, at the, the dawn of mankind, you didn't have, uh, what would you call it, your, your bilateral agreements <laughs> with other people. You had to go out there and, and fetch it. Mm. So, yes, it was a means to an end, um, to subjugate your opponent and to incorporate them. Yes, Genghis Khan right. was the master yeah, of this. Right, I mean, Genghis Khan right. wrought havoc through through mm -hmm. Asia um, mm -hmm. and effectively uh, went to the doorstep of, of China and was a warlord of his time and effectively, over the long term, a peacemaker. Well, and if we spoke about the Romans yesterday, um, they subjugated whoever they conquered, yeah. and then eventually, they were those people were fighting in the in the Roman army for them. Okay. Let's talk about innovations yeah. in war, because uh, war at a time, necessity uh, is the mother of invention, uh, and we have so many great innovations as a result. World War I, we're commemorating the 100-year start of World War I just this week. Things like plastic surgery. California would not be the same as it is today <laughs> were it not for World War I. I. I make light of it, of course, but also innovations like the, the commercial air, air travel um, has largely do evolved more quickly than perhaps it would have, courtesy of the lessons we learned in war, for example. Okay. Well, I'll take it a little bit further in terms of how companies managed and, and sort of like uh, increased in levels of production. I think there are examples that, like, for example, the beginning of the First World War, your output aircraft was approximately 200. By the time we got to the end of the war, it was something like tw something horrendous, something like 20-odd thousand aircraft were being produced. And you, you suddenly realize that, you know, the means of production, the way we produce things, the way resources were shifted around the globe, uh, especially oil, for example, I mean, you know, ships needed to to be to, to fueled. be fueled yeah. and uh, uh, this this all led to sort of like changes in the way we saw companies run the way in which companies were structured and the way in which businesses were structured I'm still very curious about you know and th we mentioned yesterday about the debt issue and America going into debt but somebody has to repay that debt yes. and that takes you know many generations to pay that debt so we create an innovative so we say expansionist policy now but does that mean our children need to repay that debt for us? Huh? And how many generations are we looking at who are going to be then harmed through this? But uh, maybe the role of innovation might outweigh the, the cost. What yeah. about that, Andrew? Is that as, a, as, a, as an argument for war? 
Well, you know, look, just to stay on the point about the debt, if you imagine that South Africa took on 30-year debt in uh, the 1980s to fight the border war, uh, South Africa is still paying off Absolutely. that debt. Um, and uh, I think your point is really well made in that regard. But war, uh, as much as I'm opposed to it in any shape or form, is not a unqualified negative. It does have some positive impacts. Mm. And... I knew you'd come around. <laughs> <laughs> Under uh, intense pressure. <laughs> but, you know, war does have uh, some positive spillovers. Rocketry, for instance, uh, is the consequence of World we War II. We would never have had the space race. We would never put people on the moon Absolutely. without those nice Germans in World, War, in World War II developing the V1 and the V2 rocket systems, for example. Uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, extreme weather gear. Uh, we made reference to, to radar this as being a cause. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we we made a reference to this uh, in our previous discussion, mm. but we also have to recognize that some of these spillovers are negative, uh, mm. and it's not just the war itself and its atrocities, but um, you know, from an economic perspective, the imposition of passports, which closes down labor mobility, that is one of the surest ways to make a country poor, is to close down labor mobility. And the, the passport is a result of World War One. It's made the point yesterday. Well, you look at, if you look at South Africa, uh, prior to the First World War and the Second World War, South Africa's economy was mining and farming. Yeah. Uh, by the end of the Second World War, we'd become an industrialized mm. nation. So it's a double-edged sword. We're on, on the one side, it, it, it created an economy for South Africa, but then if you look at what we said about the Angolan War and that, it, it uh, diminished the economy. It, it, it most slightly. certainly has, yeah. and the consequence mm. of war, and of course the, the price of war is one that generations have to bear throughout, throughout the generations. But go back to Mr. Morris, and uh, I'm sorry to harp on a single <laughs> source, but I've just recently finished the book. Um, mm -hmm. here, here's Ian Morris who says, you go back 10,000 years, your odds of being killed in conflict were one in five, based on archaeological evidence, and you look at the, uh, the, 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 the markings on, on skeletons that have been dug up. Mm -hmm. now, if you look at the entire course of World War, uh, of the 20th century, about 10 billion lives were lived during that time between 100 and 200 million people died in conflicts, in state-sanctioned conflict during that time. A one or two percent chance of being killed in war. Sure. The, the existence of war, he argues, is so horrendous that it keeps us on our best behavior. Discuss. Tell that to the, the men that fought on the Somme. <laughs> no, absolutely. And yeah. one, one just has to look at the footage and we're going to be deluged with, yeah. uh, mm. with, with footage from that period. Mm. And for anybody who's descended from people who went through that process yeah. and who may have survived, we know the consequences for future generations. But you look over a 10,000 year period, mm. warfare is mere blips on the, on, the, on, the, on the step change towards the prosperity we enjoy today. Yeah, y you, you could look at it in that regard, or you could say, if you, if you look, and then we talk about the, the young men who perished on the mm. Somme and that, and what kind of people were they? They were actually the cream of the youth of, 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 mm. the, of Britain, its empire. Yeah. Uh, Verdun was the cream of, of French youth mm. and, and German well, youth as well. Yeah. Go back to Agincourt in the, yeah. in the middle mm. of the 14th century. Yeah. Uh, Agincourt was the entire mm. aristocr French aristocracy yeah. wiped out by the English mm. archers in a single day, for but example. But Bruce, if I could just add to this, you know, when mm. we think about war, people often focus on uh, the impact on men. And we forget about the impact, or we uh, underplay the, 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 the burden borne by uh, women. And uh, this ranges all the way from losing partners, because men are more yeah. likely to be killed in war, losing sons, losing fathers, through to rape. Yeah. Uh, I, I, okay, fine. Now you've just now, now you've just brought it hor the horrible reality of war uh, down to it. I mean, um, the Wall but Street. That is the social atrocity of war. Uh, absolutely, and, 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 and it's about subjugation of society. Yes, and it's about and, and with the best way to subjugate a male population is to threaten the female population of a society. But at the same time, didn't we put women on a whole new role? Gave women a new role. Um, where they sort of like became a part of the labor force. They became a part of the, the contributors the uh, to society. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. World, World War I sees women go into factories for the first mm. time, and b by the time World War I ends, there's no question that <laughs> women will have equal voting rights. And if you see into how the complex future. this is, not, we now know why economists cannot agree <laughs> 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 on anything ever. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the short-term consequences of war, yeah. they, if, if you were guaranteed absolute mm. peace and stability for your great-great-grandchildren, people you're never going to meet. Mm. Would you go to war today to guarantee them? I guarantee you that they will have a peaceful existence. They will never have to worry about conflict ever again. Would you go to war today to guarantee, give them that guarantee? 
Well, sure. can you That's guarantee such a great that? Question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, I, he's given yeah. us a guarantee. Yes, it's better than yeah. a French guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's the sort of thing you go, no, thank you very much. Yeah. I'll let them I'll deal know. with that later yeah. on. Yeah. You know, I don't know them. They Kick the can yeah. down the road. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, we, we were talking about, about the role of women, in particular in the First and Second World Wars. Let's go back to the Anglo-Boer War, the South African yeah. War, where we saw Boer women being uh, dying in concentration sure. camps. Now, there's a story that... If you look at the Africana population of this country, it may have grown to twice the amount it is today if that war had not taken place because of what occurred to the families of the Boer people. But, but you also mm. look at the political mentality that the Boer War generated and the defensive mentality, the rise mm. of Afrikaner nationalism mm. through the 1920s, 30s and 40s, mm. um, directly re related to what was regarded as British oppression during that time and right, the consequence yeah. that has had mm. through apartheid and all of that sort of stuff. The mm. impact of war is yeah. deeply, deeply mm. complex. We're not going to agree that it was a good thing, but we do agree sure. that we are, as this generation, in a far more prosperous place than our forebears have been, partly as a result of the conflicts that they fought on our behalf, mm -hmm. thanks, to, thanks to them. Yeah. Alan superbly uh, sidestepped mm -hmm. your question. I think you should <laughs> give it to Peter next. <laughs> yeah, but the question, the problem is how do you measure it? Yeah. The measurement is our biggest concern because mm -hmm. what I'm concerned, like for example, some of the countries like uh, England, grew GDP, gross domestic product, sure. just yeah. grew at 45%, mm. while other countries like France, Germany, and Russia all dropped considerably. Who, 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 so which how do we measure that? Which have been the most powerful economies post-World War II? The Japanese had a huge surge, and they were practically devastated, as were the Germans. Without and the any German, military spending. Without yeah. any military spending. Post-World War II. Absolutely. Yeah. And yes. the Germans are one of the supreme economies of That's the right. world 70 years later. Yeah. Now, they've grown out of an environment saying, yeah. okay, that was a bad idea. We need to do things differently. Perhaps that's the benefit of war. It forces us to do things differently. It might do. Um, but you have to wonder if there isn't a... We, we can never test the alternative hypothesis because there's only one reality. But one of my favorite uh, country case studies is the story of Costa Rica. And in the late 1940s, Costa Rica is the first and to this day only country to abolish a standing army. And they do it because they say there's two million of us, there's four billion of them, what are we going to do? Mm. And they divert all of that spending to basic health care and primary education. And Costa Rica is a better place off, is better off as a result? It's a substantially better place. Uh, in fact, Costa Ricans today vote themselves in the New Economics Foundation Happy Planet Index. They vote themselves as one of the happiest populations in the world. That's because they have coffee and lots <laughs> of it. Uh, Alan Sinclair, curator of the Dutzong mm. National Museum of Military History, was one of our guests this evening. So is Peter Bauer, senior lecturer at the Faculty of Economic and Financial Sciences at the University of Johannesburg, and Dr. Adrian Saville, Chief Investment Officer at Canon Asset Managers. You see, he even named his company after a weapon of war. That's uh, it for the program this evening. Thank you for watching tonight. Uh, we will not have any more war talk. I think we'll go back to business as usual from tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye.